to go bye bye. And once Title Forty Two goes bye bye, man, it's a dude. It's a free for all. It's rapper room. I had a certain and, uh, millennial tell me, ask me, well, why on earth might you have to miss Christmas? Um, and I was like, well, you keep up current events. You know, there's a certain uh, big big event going down at the, on a border. Oh, I had no idea. I just stay up on the news more. It's like, yeah, you know, don't you think it's ironic that, and it truly is ironic, get you guys' opinions on this, that millennials and Gen Zers, Zoomers, whatever you want to call them, have the most information at their fingertips in, in the history of humankind, yet they're the least informed. To me, that that's that's ironic. Now, Gen Xers are no better. You know, you think about us. Uh, I mean, we have all that information too, our, our uh, peers, yet we're uninformed. But the ironic part of it is the millennials and the Gen Zers have had that their entire lives and they're still uninformed. And uh, this certain millennial took great offense at me saying that. And I was like, hey, it's not personal. Don't take it personal. It's true. You know, I think that's ironic. What do you guys think? Is that ironic or am I just... I well, no, I think at that age too, you're, you're looking at what's important to them. Cause when I look at what I cared about when I, well, everybody knows what I cared about when I was 18 years old. So when I look at what I cared about when I was 18 years old versus what I care about now, it's a lot different. I mean, back then I didn't give a crap about taxes, right? I didn't give a crap about borders. I mean, we did in it to an extent because of our jobs, like you had to be, I mean, just our jobs, all three of us, you, you were forced to be more informed than the typical 18, 19, 20, 22, year, all up to 30 year old. Right. Uh, but when you look at, when I look at my son and my kids, what they're interested in and, and you know, my middle daughter, she's pretty smart. Uh, all, all three of my kids are pretty smart, but when you look at how much in the weeds they get and how much they actually follow, it's tough because I mean, we had the luxury, at least two of us, uh, working from home where I can have the news on all day surf the news, you know, in between jobs, in between tasks with your job, with what you do, you're, you're again, forced to be in the know of what's going on. And, you know, when you're, I look at my boy, when he's a 20 year old going to ASU, uh, you know, dude, the only thing he cares about is like cars and chicks and getting beer, uh, illegally. That, that, that's like his world right now. And you know what, when something impacts him, that's what he cares about. So when you talk about gun control, now he gives a crap, right? He gives a crap about guns, but uh, until something like punches him in the face, he's not going to care. And he won't care for another five or 10 years. No, I agree. I think it's, a, it, it's, it's ironic. Like Lou says, plus it's, you know, it's what you said, but at, at this point with social media, with, you know, what 99% of the known information in the world being available at your fingertips at this point, it's a willful, willful ignorance. Um, you know, the 24 hour news cycle, you have it, it's there. And I get the, you know, the whole, like, it doesn't impact you, you know, it, you don't care about it until it impacts you. I don't know, man, even, even as a kid, like we got the paper every day, I read the paper every day and it didn't matter. And it's just because, I mean, it, you're either going to read the paper, you can read a book or you're going to read, you know, the Sears Roebuck catalog. Like that was your, you know, that was your options. Then, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly, Luke. YouTube viewers, you'll have to go on to, uh, you, you have to, you have to check out the YouTube to see what Luke was doing, you know, and the correlation to the uh, Sears Roebuck catalog um, and young boys. So, but you had that, and you know, then like six o'clock was local news, and six thirty, like you know, Dan Rather or Peter Jennings or whoever you know you watch came on, and that was it. And uh, you know my parents always watch the news. They, you know, they watch the, the local, the national news. And even if I wasn't watching it with them, it was still within earshot because our house wasn't that big. And, uh, you know, so I can still hear what's going on. So I get it. Young people don't necessarily, you know, may not necessarily care, um, but they're bombarded with it. And so I think at this point, if you don't know, I think it's willful ignorance, especially if you live in a border state and, you're above the age of 18 and you don't know what's going on with the border in your state. That's willful ignorance at that point. That's all that is. That, that is 100% willful ignorance. Well, the, the argument I got from this particular millennial was, well, it's so difficult with so much out there, you know, there's, there's, you know, over, over inundated. And I mean, I get that, but it does take effort. No doubt. I mean, we had a, a, a podcast talking about, cause we had a few listeners, where do you guys get your news? You know? And, um, uh, you know, we did, we did that podcast and, and kind of talked about how the three of us get our news. My thing is, you know, people, I think human nature doesn't fundamentally change between generations. You know, I remember looking at, you know, the catalogs and, and stuff like that and being so bored. 
like, you know, if it was cold outside, you couldn't go, it's too snowing or something. And, you know, the electricity was out, but it was still light inside. I'd be going through the catalogs on every page. I'd be like, if I could have any, just one thing on each page, what would it be? You know, I pick out something from every page. My point is I was bored and a dreamer as a kid and all kids are dreamers. But now I think that this, you know, all the social media and everything has just made it easier. It dreams for them. They don't have to use their imagination and, and things like that. But yeah, I, I guess the thrust of it, of the conversation with that millennial is, you know, with, with me anyway, and this person, I was like, I mean, it just takes effort, you know, and this person, part of this person's job, it's a her, it's my daughter. <laughs> we had an argument. <laughs> She's not going to listen. It doesn't matter. But uh, the thrust of it was, you know, it affects your job. You said earlier that you need to follow the news. You know, I can't break down to you in two minutes how I've developed, you know, my method of following the news. And you guys have a distinct method as well. It just takes, it takes effort and it takes a lot of reading and it takes a discerning eye, right? You've got to, you've got to be able to pick out what's opinion and what's fact. And that boy, that's really hard for, uh, for the kids growing up, you know, anywhere from, you know, 16 to 30, if you think about it. I mean, you guys have seen it. We've all complained about it, it but it is what it is. I, I, jo- Roger, I was telling Josh that I didn't really start paying, a, truly paying attention to the world around me and digging into things. I didn't read the newspaper. I delivered the newspaper as a kid, but I didn't really read it uh, like Josh did. But I think it was, I don't know, my mid to late 20s. I don't know what clicked in me. I think it was Bosnia, Josh. I think that's why I was telling you. When Bosnia yeah. kicked off, I was like, what? And I watched this video the date and accords or something is a long documentary like eight parts and i was like man i am really i'm this is fascinating to me i i could go over there very soon i started really researching it and find out about it but it was i i guess that was the trigger point I, I found it interesting but until that point uh i was just listening to whatever rush, rush limbaugh said on his show and just accepting it it's like yep yep not not giving it much thought did you did you ever have a turning point where you're like okay now I find this stuff fascinating. I find it interesting, so on and so forth. Well, I think it just goes back to like when, when you talk, we talk about the jobs that we did, you know, for me early on, I deployed right out of the gate. So I went to Haiti. So immediately, you know, you don't want to be the dumb guy and then young Joe's right. You want to make sure that you're, you're standing out and above your peers or whatever. So you start studying the history and Rene Preval and Aristide and this and that, and you start to learn about, it's like, okay, I'm kind of interested in this. Yeah, there you go. And then, you know, when I went to Korea after that, so you start studying up on that and you get, so eventually with our jobs, you continue to, uh, the interest is forced upon you. And then this becomes what, you know, it becomes everything that you do. And especially if you want to be good at what you're doing, we're just fortunate that both of those, uh, align, right. It's the same objective. Uh, so it's some self-improvement. I don't know. Maybe it's self-improvement because the other side, you know, the other side of it is there's the ignorance is bliss. You look at what's going on now. Like, I don't know if, you know, you talk about red pill, blue pill, and black pill, right? And so everybody knows from the matrix, the red pill and the blue pill, red pill, you know, you, you see the world uh, the way it truly is. The the blue pill, you go back to la la land. Uh, and the black pill is when you OD on the red pills uh, and you realize that we are so far down this rabbit hole. And this would, this would be Josh. If this was the three of us, that would be Josh. <laughs> You're so far down the rabbit hole with the red pill that you realize that you can't come back from it. You know, so I don't know, you know, on one hand, it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, what? it's kind of nice to be informed. On the other hand, it's like ignorance is bliss because I know a lot of stupid people that are really, really happy. And I, and I think the, the one thing that starts to force people and, and, and I know we'll get into some of this cryptocurrency and, and some of this other stuff, but, uh, I think Josh has got more info on the, on the EO. That's the whole point. You know, people will care when you start to punch them in the face with issues and number one issue being money. And when you look at, I mean, we, I think you guys where I was old enough to stand in a pay line at basic training when you went to the gym and you had to go salute the pay officer and they, they counted out your cash and gave me my $322 or whatever it was. Uh, and that's what you had. Right. And since then, since that time, and some of it's due to, you know, obviously technological advances, but, uh, money has gone more and more digital. Even nowadays, like you don't see your money. We've talked about that before. You don't see your money. You, you look into your account and you just hope to God. And I tell you how many people, you, you, like it is unreal how many people don't actually look at their pay stubs every now and then uh, to make sure that they're getting paid what they're supposed to get paid. They just, you know what? We look in our checking account and uh, yeah, there's money in there. So yeah, I, I got paid. 
Uh, you know, very few people actually verify, you're not beating to my kids. You got to verify it because, you know, hours will be off and they owe you money. You're overtaxed, yada, yada, yada. But now that we've gone to this, uh, predominantly digital method of currency, talking about direct deposits and ATM, Zelle, Venmo, PayPal, all that stuff, uh, you don't see it as much. It doesn't slap you in the face. So people just don't care. And I think, you know, I know we're, we're transitioning a little bit here off topic, but it's going to get worse because it's not about, it starts out as convenience for most, I think. I think when, when people look at, they look at a, a convenience factor. I can pay faster. Uh, I can verify funds faster. It's not a, oh, here's my check. Let me wait seven or eight days. Of course, some of us needed that during float check days, right? But uh, nowadays you can't do that stuff. So it starts off with a convenience thing. And even as the economy grows, that's why we had to go away from the gold standard. Part of the reason was the economy cannot grow fast enough based off the gold standard. Uh, so they went away from that. Now you can agree with it, disagree with it, and there's other avenues or, or whatever. But you know, it starts off as a convenience and speed of the economy. But I think as we've seen, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the Twitter files, uh, and I'll kick it over to Josh for for his info on the EO. You've got certain folks out there who unfortunately are in power that it's not about convenience, it's about control. They want to be able to control what you spend. They want to be able to control what you see. They want to be able to control what you eat, control where you go. And when you look at COVID over the last two, three years, that's been exactly what it is. It's complete control. So with that, I'll kick it over to Josh. He can give us uh, an update on this executive order. I think it goes into effect, what, next year, right? Beginning of next year? It went into effect today. Ah, there, close enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> so the, the, the EO that Roger's talking about, Executive Order 14067, it's titled Ensuring Responsible Development of Digital Assets. So Joe Biden signed it. Uh, on March 9th of this year, and uh, and it took effect um, today. So what is it? What does it mean, right? The, the, the title is very ambiguous, you know, ensuring responsible development of digital assets. It's very innocuous. It's very innocent sounding. Um, and, uh, you know, but you, you, you kind of read, yeah, you, you, you read the fine print, read between the lines and, and, and see where that's going. And, you know, standing alone by itself is not that big of a deal. When you read, you know, when you just look at the EO, you know, uh, myself, but you start adding in, you know, all the other stuff that that's happened in the financial industry and it, it's a little scary, right? <clears throat> so, you know, so really what it's looking at, it, there's, so there's five main goals. Um, and one of those is, is they're looking to establish, or they're, they're, it's directed to, you know, conduct further analysis on establishing a central bank of digital currency for the United States. Okay. So think of it as like Bitcoin's evil cousin. Um, you know, the other goals and, and they put these up front, right? So it's just, and it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, up in the, it's, it's the Fugazi. It's, you know, oh, well, you know, protect consumers and investors. Okay. Well, how? Well, it doesn't say how. It just says protect them. Right. Uh, it's, you know, the, one of the goal, monetary stability, they're trying to buy down financial and national security risk, which, I mean, dude, you can take that and run with that, you know, however far you want to, you know, I mean, that's how we wound up with TSA and DHS and, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're protecting, we're protecting us citizens and it's supposed to, you know, encourage economic competitiveness and responsible innovation. Well, define responsible. Well, it doesn't, um, so right now it doesn't change the way digital currencies are governed. All right. That, that EO does not change that, but what it does, it establishes, it kind of establishes like a foundation for a regulatory framework for eventual, you know, government oversight and control of digital currencies. And you know, when Biden came into office, there's a big push, especially with Bitcoin, um, you know, and, and, and Dogecoin and all that stuff because people were able to, you know, buy things and make do conduct transactions, you know, outside of, uh, uh, you know, basically outside of banks um, and government uh, oversight. And, you know, at the end of the day, people, the government doesn't like that. Why? What's the primary reason the, the government doesn't like that? It's because you're not paying tax on it, right? The government's not getting their share. And that's what almost everything always comes back to. That's why, you know, that's why moonshine's illegal. Right. Sell a moonshot. That's why that's illegal, because the government doesn't get their tax. 
That's why, you know, selling bootleg cigarettes on the sidewalk, you know, that's why it's illegal. That's why, you know, what I forget is Eric Garner up in New York died, you know, because he was selling, you know, he, he, dude, he was selling Newports on the sidewalk and the government wasn't getting their cut. That's why that, uh, 10 times out of 10 is because the government's not getting their tax. So again, you got to go back to that fine print is what is this leading up to when you layer on, you know, the, the World Economic Forum, a lot of the things that they're talking about um, and, and some other folks. So there's this guy called uh, Augustine Carsons. He is the general manager for the Bank of International Settlements. I don't know if you guys have heard about him or heard. I listened to a uh, I listened to a video of him today. Um, he gave a, a, a really quick speech. And these were just a couple of snippets that uh that he you know that that he had this so he he made this speech in october of 2020 and he you know was like right now we don't know who is using 100 bills we need to know who is using 100 bills and he mentioned another currency in there as well um you know and he goes on to talk about how the bank for international settlements you know, eventually needs to have, quote, absolute control, which will determine the use of that financial expression, you know, meaning whatever currency that you're that you're dealing in. And then he goes on to further explain how they are working with the World Economic Forum to have technology and, you know, implement to develop and implement technology that will enforce that. So when you start talking about, you know, digital currency having, you know, a central bank in the United States tied to, you know, let's say the bank for international settlements that controlling your currency, think about all the ramifications for that. Right. uh, Me personally, I don't think it's any different than, you know, China's social credit system. Um, And we've already seen some of that. And uh, I'm going to kick it to Luke to, to get his thoughts on what he thinks of the EO, you know, what he's been able to read of it. But, uh, but I got a lot more to say, especially on the social credit system, because we've already seen that over the last you know, six, eight years. Uh, so Luke, based on uh, what you've read and uh, what I just kind of laid out on that, what are some of your, your, your initial, initial thoughts? Well, I, I see this definitely as a framework, number one, for uh, trying to exert some kind of control over the digital currency market. And, you know, if you go <laughs> to the empty heads talking on Twitter, they're like, well, this is perfect timing. Look what happened to Sam Bankman Freed and FTX, man. We need some control on that. But at the end of the day, if you really dig into what uh, Sam Bankman Freed, and I'll call him SBF from now on, Sam Bankman Freed, if you look at what he did, it was just good old fashioned embezzlement and wire fraud. I mean, the fact that it was digital currency, all he did was manipulate his own currency, inflate it. There was a run on it and you know, whatever. It, it, it's, it's not too complicated, but it's not worth getting into. Uh, but again, there, I think that the, the thrust of this, number one, is to try to get, a, get some, try to exert some kind of control of the blockchain, which is going to be difficult to do. But the EO does give the framework to start exploring options to do that. That's number one. Now, that's one thing it does. The most important thing it does, as Josh was, was covering, is uh, set up the possibility of a central, what was it, the central bank digital currency, which is going is setting the framework for the new dollar, if you will. Uh, that's what they want to do. I mean, because if, if you're after power, that's what you want. You want a central currency that you control every aspect of it. So, I mean, why do you think that they, they put in the whole $600 on PayPal or Venmo? You know, so, so they can they can quash that, you know, that uh, that uh, that side gig you got uh, so they can start taxing that. Like Josh said, I mean, they are after every single penny they can possibly get their hands on. I believe you me. I know that <laughs> I mean, I've had experience with that. You know, it's just uh, it, it's it's exerting control. Uh, they want their revenue. Uh, I think I think that's the path we're on. And I know Josh is going to get into it. And I kind of want to take a, a side tangent here. You know, we talk a lot on this podcast. If you if you hear us talk, we talk a lot about slippery slope and we get really pissed off when people say, well, it's a logical fallacy. Well, we're not talking about logic here. We're talking about learned experience. It's the same thing as saying history. Uh, what does they say? History do, uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes or something like that. But it's like 
if you if you don't learn from history, you're doomed, doomed to repeat it. It's the same thing as saying this is a slippery slope. That's not a logical argument. It's just like, hey, use some common sense. And, you know, when we say this is laying the framework for a central digital currency issued by the Fed and controlled by the Fed, you don't spend a penny. There, there will be no more cash. We say things like this, and I think people think, you know, Oh, they're just, oh, they're just going to, you know, to the, to the extreme, you know, they don't have any proof to back that up, but, but Roger, let me ask you this, man. We've been right on a lot of things. I'm kind of reading off a tweet that was not tweeted by us. We were right about the lockdowns, right? We were right about that because we were critical thinkers and we're like following that, 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 that road, you know, logical road. Hmm. Is this going to work? You know, what are going to be the ramifications of this? You, know, you talk about the triple dimmick. You heard about that on the news, everybody? We called that stuff. We're really trying really hard not to cuss. We called that stuff <laughs> a year and a half ago. So we were right about that. Is it because we're scientists? No, it's not. It's because we're critical thinkers. We sit down and talk about this stuff. So we were right about that. We were right about the vaccine. We were right about masks. Right on. First off, we were right about masks. We were right about Hunter's laptop. Uh, we were right about some sort of election, you know, a little bit of election, you know, funny business going on there. We're right about that. That's being proven every day. We were right about Twitter suppression, right? We were right about all that stuff because we were observing the world around us. We'd be like, well, this is the logical conclusion of where this goes. It's like a slippery slope. And I think we're right. I think we're right about this too, with this executive order 14067. It lays the groundwork for that. And you, you y'all mark my words, when we all retire, it's all going to be digital currency. Unless there's a major shift in the way things are going. Josh is typing something. Josh is typing something right before I kick it to Roger. No, it's not coming. Go ahead, kick, so it, Roger, go ahead kick it to Roger. <laughs> so, Roger, what, um, what are your thoughts about it? I, I personally believe that this is the only, one of the, the thrust of this in the long run is laying the groundwork for a central digitized currency uh, that can be oh, yeah, that, that, that's completely where it's going. controlled. And yeah, that's where it's on going. On a side note. Before I kick it to you, Elon Musk is kind of making little comments on Twitter here and there that uh, he's going to do something like a PayPal 2.0, some sort of something. And I think that's going to have to do with digital currency. And the rumor is he's going to establish something where if you do business on Twitter, you pay in Dogecoin. Now, that's just kind of what people are saying. But anyway, that's that's kind of beside the point. So 140.67, what, what are your thoughts? It goes back to control. I mean, you hit it on the head. There are people that want to control. And, and here's how, I mean, imagine this. So when we talk about digital currency, we're going beyond uh, cryptocurrency and what's out there right now. We're talking about the elimination of physical cash, ATM machines, all that stuff. You will basically have a number uh, that is allocated to you, you know, from your job that the U.S. government facilities, the banks will hold. Uh, that you'll be able to spend every bit of this. And, and I'll, here's one of the tenants as, as Josh was reading some of them. Here's one of the tenants mitigate the illicit finance and national security risks posed by the illicit use of digital assets, which means that they are going to essentially track or have the ability to track every single penny where it goes, who it came from, where it went, what you bought, what you did with it. Cause imagine this, imagine, and here's how you people, People think we're crazy. People think we're conspiracy theorists and this and that. No, we're not. We just we just know how the government is and, and we've read enough books to see how history. I mean, it's totally off topic. I think, Josh, you posted something earlier today about Australia, right? Uh, you know, having enough social points to be able to go online. Yeah. How, dude, man, how crazy is that? Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, touch on that in a minute, but it's the, that's where it's coming to. So imagine this, uh, you know what? State of California, as they already have, basically says, hey, we don't like the Second Amendment screw that. So now you live in San Francisco, you want to go buy some ammo and they say, Nope, sorry, not going to authorize that. You cannot use your digital currency for that. That can happen very, very easy. Hey, sorry. You know what, California, we ban the, uh, the sale of handguns here in the state of California. Um, yeah, can't use digital currency here either. We're going to ban that. Oh, Hey, you happen to be a little bit overweight. Can't buy any Cheetos either. Right. Uh, Oh, you, 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 you know, you, you're not green enough. Well, you know what? We're going to stop you from, from, from buying gas powered lawnmowers or generators. I mean, that's what you're doing is you're giving the federal government 
complete control over what you can and cannot spend. Do I think there needs to be some type of oversight or, you know, I don't even call it regulatory oversight. I mean, here's a, here's a fact right now is cryptocurrency. They're killing themselves. They're killing themselves. Like what FTX did was straight embezzlement, right? Money came in. Uh, it couldn't go directly to FTX. It had to be wire transferred to Alameda, uh, which was also owned by SBF. And the money that went there was credited to their accounts, uh, but never actually made it to FTX, right? Now, when they go, sorry, what's up, Luke? And they were buying FTX's own digital currency with right. that money. It was like money laundering. With that money. And then they go to sell to one of their competitors, Binance. Binance takes a look at the books and they're like, whoa, what's going on here, right? So yeah, we're not going to buy this thing out. So what happens is what Luke said, they're, they're, there's a run on the bank. So basically all the investors, they get this news, they say, screw this. I got to go start pulling my money out. And what do they do? They shut it off. And all that money's gone. I mean, <laughs> well, you're hearing no people. In the first place. <laughs> no, well, it was all kept in Alameda anyway, you know? And so when you sit there and you look at it and you got all these people like Kevin O'Leary, you know, lost supposedly like $15 million. You had the Tom Brady's out there pushing this stuff. Supposedly he'd lost like, you know, X a million, you know, amount of million dollars or whatever. They're, the crypto space is killing themselves anyway, because I do believe there is a need for it. And, and I think there's a future in crypto, unfortunately, because it is the wild west right now. Uh, they've probably delayed the evolution and the use of cryptocurrency by a decade at least. And the other piece to this, and I'll, I'll throw it over to Josh because I know he gets a little bit more in the weeds to it. What's anybody know? What's the average age of the, of the senator of a senator in the in, in the U.S. Congress? Anybody know off the top of their head? Somebody gurgle that. What's the average age? I'll gurgle. Like how 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 old is Chuck Grassley? Right? How uh, old is <laughs> that dude's not even buying green bananas anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can have a couple of speckles. That's what he's looking at. How old is Mitch McConnell? How old is President Biden? How old is former President Trump? The average age is 58.4 years. 58.4 years old. That's the average. So it kind of goes back to the left's argument with gun control. I'm sorry, talking about I'm sorry, Roger. That's for the House. For the Senate, it's 64.3. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so even worse. I thought the House would actually be younger than that. So, so 60 years old, right? Both of them, 62 years old, if you combine them at 62 year, years old is the average age of your congressperson. And so you sit there and, and it's like the left with their arguments with uh, gun control and regulations with gun control. It's like these people have no idea what they're talking about, talking about throwing away clips and you can't reload and this and that and assault style and military grade. How many of those 62 year olds do you think actually know anything about cryptocurrency? How many of those 62 year olds actually know anything about digital currency? Most of them don't. And that's why you don't hear it so mainstream. But what happens is something like this gets passed, right? And now here's where all the nefarious actions take place because somebody who's on the administration does know enough about it. And, you know, you can look at it with what happened with Twitter. Somebody, uh, you know, on that administration, left or right, doesn't matter, Democrat, Republican, says that, yeah, we should be able to control this. It's no different than like, hey, hey, we're going to protect you from yourself. We're going to protect you from those bag of, you know, that bag of Cheetos that you're, that you're getting ready to buy and eat that you don't need to eat. We're going to protect you from that gun that you're getting ready to buy. We're going to protect you from that lawnmower that you were getting ready to buy. Uh, you know, that's going to pollute the, the ozone and the atmosphere and kill us all. We're going to protect you from COVID. Yeah, that's exactly it. So essentially what happens is the world becomes a giant prison commissary that you can buy what the government allows you to buy, what they deem fit for you, which is the exact opposite of freedom that, hey, you know what? I got it, man. I'm packing on an extra 10 or 15 pounds. And if I want to shove that bear claw down my gullet, by God, I can do that because I'm in America, right? But that's not going to happen. That stuff goes away and people sit here and say, oh, you're just nuts. You're extreme. I tell you what, take a look at everything, Luke, go back to the game tape and, and everything that Luke just said. And we're not geniuses. We just, hey, like the mass thing and, and social isolation, which, by the way, they're trying to bring all that stuff back. I mean, man, that's kind of like sixth grade science. You know, that was like sixth grade health class, man. Hey, guess what? Wash your hands. Don't lick the doorknobs. You know, make sure you go out there and, and do some exercise, that, that, that type of stuff. It's not, not rocket science, but it doesn't fit people's narrative. And I think one of the things that separates us, I'd like to believe, and I know ideologically we all lean to the right conservatively as far as our beliefs 
Uh, but when you look at political party or left or right, I think one thing that separates us is we'll call a spade a spade. You know, I don't want to go too much on a tangent here, but like cinema going, uh, you know, becoming an independent and the people here in Arizona are fired up. And I'm like, wait a minute. You didn't vote for the best candidate to represent the state? No, you voted purely along party lines, which most people do. The same candidate they voted for because they switched. Oh, sorry. Can't go along with it. Can't go along with it. But before I get too far down the road there, let me throw it back to Josh. I know he's got some more uh, some more in the weeds on the executive order. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you you brought up the you brought up the firearms piece. And you know, a lot of people say Joe Biden's the, you know, the worst president, you know, in in modern American history. And I don't think that's true. I'm telling you, the worst president in modern American history is Barack Obama. Because Barack Obama laid the groundwork he started for it. yeah, for a lot of what we're seeing now. So you talk about so you talk about the firearms, you know, stuff. Um so in 2013, Obama started uh, the U.S. Department of Justice under President Obama started what they called Operation Choke Point, and it was started investigating business dealing between banks and firearms companies. All right, and so what it did, it you know, it put pressure on a lot of banks and you know these other pay platforms like PayPal um, and stuff not to do business with firearms companies. So you're you know so Square, Apple Pay. And you know, it, they took a lot of stances against not only, you know, per, firearm per, purchases, but just pieces, firearms, pieces and parts. Um, you know, there's a, yeah, a Jennifer Wexton. Uh, she's a representative from Virginia, Democrat. She introduced a gun violence uh, prevention through Financial Intelligence Act. Right. So this push for bank and credit card companies to automatically provide transaction data to federal authorities on firearms purchase with the goal of identifying, quote, suspicious activity. Right. Again, this is all in the this is all under the guise of we have to keep people safe. Right. We we have to keep people safe. It's like when the United States goes overseas to a country and it's like we're going to bring democracy to you. We're like we're going to free the shit out of you is what we're going to do. Right. And we're going to bomb your country back to the Stone Age. So uh, then Governor Phil Murphy in New Jersey signed an executive order, mandated information for banks detailing their relationships and practices and policies regarding government manufacturers and sellers. All right. Connecticut State Treasurer Sean Wooden uh, announced plans to redistribute $30 million worth of shares in civilian firearm manufacturer securities. Uh, under the quote responsible gun policy, right? So we talk about responsible, right? And so you go back up to one of the goals of the uh, of this new executive order: responsible innovation. And that's a quote from it, right? Responsible. It's a it's the same. It, all this is the same verbiage, right? It's the same playbook. It's not. This is not. Uh, you know, anything crazy. Uh, California Assemblywoman, you know, last year she put a uh, you know she put a bill in urging banks to stop lending gun manufacturers and gun retailers money. Um, and then Citibank, right? So now we're getting into the big, the big banks that, you know, that, that have a lot of WASTA um, and its parent, parent company, Citigroup. They, uh, they said that they were no longer going to, you know, basically extend lines of credit to gun manufacturers. And it also requires all of its retail clients not to sell firearms to, uh, to customers. Bank of America, same thing. They're going to stop lending money, extending lines of credit to gun manufacturers that make, quote, military style weapons, right? Military style weapons. What's a military style weapon? I don't well, know. Well, nobody I mean, makes them. So, uh, you yeah, know, they right. should be good, I mean, right? I mean, I carried a Glock 19 and a SIG and, you know, other things. Are those military style? I don't know. The Berkshire Bank, um, you know, after the uh, Orlando shooting, it said it wasn't going to extend a line of credit to SIG Sauer because that was the, uh, the type of rifle, the MCX model that was used in the Orlando nightclub uh, shooting. Wells Fargo is the only bank to date who has, who has a, uh, a grade of F on this, uh, you know, this, this, this financial activism scorecard because Wells Fargo came out and said that is a protected right. And as long as, you know, someone is not doing something blatantly illegal we will extend them the line of credit and the money to exercise not only their rights, but, you know, to, to participate in a free economy. 
Wells Fargo knows full well what riding shotgun means. I mean, exactly. They got their, their I was thinking the same training. thing. <laughs> yeah, man. Look at the same thing. Wells Fargo's. They, yeah, no, they, Wells Fargo has obviously not forgotten its culture, right? The culture that that, that, that company is, uh, is based on. Um, and MasterCard and Visa also said that they will not stop co- customers from making lawful purchases. But here's where, you know, so it goes back and, you know, maybe this can kind of start dovetailing into the, uh, you know, the, the Twitter files. When you look at banks, banks receive a lot of federal funding, a lot. All right. So when banks turn around and even though, you know, some people might argue, well, banks are a private, you know, private entity. Well, they're not because they receive federal funding right from the government. So therefore, that makes them an extension of the government. And when they turn around and these banks start saying, well, we're not, you know, we're not extending a line of credit you know, for this, we're freezing this, you know, transaction right here because we don't, you know, we're the, we're, we're going to exercise some financial activism and be the morality police. It's absolutely incorrect. And it's a violation of your constitutional rights. And for those out there who are going to autom- you know, who are going to try and come at us and say, oh, well, the federal reserve is the one that actually gives the banks the money. The federal reserve is a part of the United States government. I don't care how you slice it because the federal reserve was created in 1913 by the Federal Reserve Act to serve as the nation's central bank. The Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. is an agency of the federal government and reports to and is directly accountable to the Congress. They're the ones that run the Federal Reserve, right? The board is nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. All right. They are an extension of the federal government. So don't come at us. Don't come at us. It was like, well, you know, the Federal Reserve is, you know, the USG. It is. It absolutely is. It acts on their behalf. Um, but you think about all of this stuff that has been done, you know, and, and you talk about this, you know, Luke brought up the slippery slope when they started tearing down Confederate statues after their savior, George Floyd died, you know, we were like, Hey, that's a really slippery slope. If we're going to overlay, you know, our moral, our, you know, quote, moral standards of today with those in the, you know, in the 1800s, even the 1700s. And, you know, people are like, no, that's a slippery slope. That's a slippery slope fallacy, you know, blah, blah. Well, Nobody said anything when they started tearing down statues of Columbus. They started tearing down statues of the founding fathers. They even started tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln because, quote, he just didn't do enough for slavery, right, to, to get rid of slavery, even, you know, which is as ridiculous as, you know, it is as ridiculous as it sounds, right? So don't come at us with the slippery slope stuff. Luke's spot on. It, you know, people say that, you know, it's like the conspiracy theory. We've joked about it on here. What's the difference between conspiracy theory and reality? About six months, right? That's about the running timeline. So, you know, this executive order, I, I think it's it's the beginning of some very dark things that, that we don't want to do. And it was done via executive order. It was done without the approval of Congress. It was done without the approval of the states. And most importantly, it was done without the approval of the American people who it is absolutely, you know, going to, going to impact the most, you know, like Luke pointed out and Roger pointed out that, you know, a lot of these people who are implementing this are going to be dead and gone, um, you know, before this gets implemented. So again, I'll go back to, you know, I say it a lot. People, 1984 was a warning. 1984 by George Orwell was a warning. It was not a how-to guide. Um, so I don't know if Luke's got anything else to add on to all that, or if uh, he wants to touch on the uh, the Twitter files. Hey, man, it's a buffet. You pick and choose what you want, brother. <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of kick it to Roger too. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of things out there, and Roger can grab bag it if he wants. He can go all over the place with this stuff. Um, yeah, I, I think that was a, a fairly good rundown. I mean, my opinion, because I think everything we do on this show is fairly good. But of executive order one one forty sixty seven, but you know we'll keep tabs on that and and kind of look at read the tea leaves and and see what's going on and y'all prepare for my dogs to bark because my wife's about to get home from work and they're just going to go nuts and y'all are just going to have to deal with it. I'm talking to the audience, not you guys, because we deal with Josh's dog barking all the time. So basically, you know, Roger, first thing is all that news on those China protests, the protests going on in China over the lockdowns, boy, that just kind of faded from the news, didn't it? Isn't that kind of strange how that happened? Uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, that's kind of, I mean, that, that, that kind of reared its ugly head and then kind of went back down. But what I, I'd like to talk about a little bit is Elon Musk, okay? Uh, the guy is making a lot of waves right now. I'm kind of pricing out Tesla's 
I'm looking at my uh, my star link. I think uh, one of the three of us already has that. Uh, I just think the guy is a geo, what, what they call him. They called him a geopolitical agent of chaos. Like I would put that on my business card. If the media Heck called yeah. me that, I'd be like, oh, dude, that's like a Bond villain mixed with the Joker and all this stuff. I think that's the coolest thing in the world. I really like some of the stuff he's doing. And one of the things he said was, uh, my pronouns are prosecute slash Fauci. I thought that was hilarious. And boy, people got pissed about that. Uh, another thing, Roger, is how do you think that Elon Musk, because he like randomly selects people and replies to their stuff and all of a sudden, boom, into the stratosphere that tr- that tweet goes and into the stratosphere their followers go and all that stuff. And he seems to, uh, it seems to be he's picking a lot of, you know, Matt Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald, those types of people, and like even Tim Pool and one of the hosts on his show, uh, Sour Patch Lids, uh, Lydia, what's her name that's on his show? He's commented on her stuff a few times. Like, where is he? But on the other hand, he's like picking out some like randos out there on Twitter and just commenting on it. So how does he do that, man? Is he just, I mean, he has access to everything. He probably looks at you know, he probably enters into the algorithm, Elon Musk and this and that. Show me all the tweets on that. And then he'll just pick one out of a hat and comment on it just to be a not a troll, but like the opposite of a troll, like a like a benevolent troll. And I, I think it's I think it's hilarious. And I think we talked about this last episode. I my own Twitter experience has gotten better. And I don't know if that's my bias, like I said, last episode or what, but. And the Twitter files, you know, the release of those, the way they're doing them is is pretty good because he's he's using his own platform he just bought to break what he feels is a pretty big news story. And, you know, like I said earlier, we were right about that because we were observing what was going on. It's just like I, I'm not seeing anything on Twitter. It's just it's a bore. It's getting to be a boring platform. The people who it wasn't boring for was the you know the the super left journalists who were just inside their own echo chamber pushing their own message it wasn't boring for them but it was boring for the rest of us now it's getting back to the more wild west it's kind of fun and i'm also seeing way more viewpoints that disagree with mine and i like that and I, i'm commenting on this stuff and it's it's a lot more fun i you know and before i kick it to you so you could talk about elon musk and the twitter files if you want or the china protests or Hunter's laptop, whatever you want to go with that. But before I do that, I'll tell Darren, who had a very specific request. I see Josh, he's breaking his rule, which is a good thing. Check out YouTube. I'm going to tell Darren, who had a very specific request. Darren, yes, we will cover Mike Leach and Chris Beard later on. Mike Leach, rest in peace, but we'll cover that later on. So Roger, what do you think, man? Elon Musk, Twitter Files, Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss. Well, when you look at the China thing and the media thing, that that's actually one subject in itself that, that encompasses all of this. Uh, but before I get into that, you do need to go on YouTube because uh, Luke's wife showed up. I'm pretty sure there was a wardrobe malfunction back there when she was dancing as you were talking. So I might have to go back and check the game tape and blow that up a little bit. But uh, I don't know. One of the I things s- that Elon Musk ha- has pushed for is dialogue on Twitter. Because the way it used to be is you had these five or six, and it was more than that. It's probably like, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, big time leftists, you know, 20 million followers, whatever. And they would tweet. And then it was just retweeted and liked and retweeted and liked with a comment here and there. And it's just a giant echo chamber. And one of the things that he put out was like, hey, look, there's really not a whole lot of dialogue and interaction that's going on with Twitter. So I want to believe, taking an educated guess, that it's planned when he responds to the little guy, he's kind of like giving the voice to the little guy, you know, where it's not just the, uh, the big players in journalism or the big players in government who have the, you know, the microphone, it's everybody's got a microphone and you want people to engage in dialogue. Uh, it's like you said, I don't mind it. You know, I, I, I get on there and I'll post something or, or retweet or whatever. Hey man, I'm all ears. If I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong. Hey, you're wrong because of this. I have noticed it getting better because in the past you'd be like, if I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong. They'd be like, Oh, F you, you're just wrong. Okay. Well you suck. And and those guys are still there and they still suck. But I I am, I am starting to see a lot more. Well, because of this and that, and then you point out some things. It's like, Oh, okay. I didn't see this. I didn't see that. Or I agree with this or, 
you know, whatever. And, and even some folks, uh, what's her name? Nina Turner, I think, you know, I don't know if she's converting me or if we're converting her. I think, you know, a couple of days ago, I mentioned like five tweets in a row. I was like, man, I actually agree with what she's saying with this. I actually agree with what she's saying with this. Uh, and, and not ashamed to come up back. Like, yeah, this, this actually makes sense. But I think you are starting to get more interaction. The bigger problem is you're realizing how much now going back to what Josh's thing said, because this is what everybody's going to say. Well, you guys said a couple episodes ago, private company, do whatever the hell they want. Yeah, absolutely right. Private company, do whatever they want. And you're starting to see that with Apple and China and, and what's going on there. The difference is, like Josh said, was when the government is influencing the way you operate or suggesting the way you should operate, you become an arm of the government. And in Twitter's case is a direct violation of the first amendment. The fact that you have government employees. Okay. And it's happened out here in Arizona. Dude, the receipts are right there. Why people don't care is beyond me. What They don't get it is what it is. They don't understand that the government cannot go to a private organization. But like, hey, you need to censor these people. You need to shadow ban these people. You need to block these people. You need to push their comments down so people, it, it's a violation of freedom of speech of the First Amendment. That's the violation here. That's, if it was just Twitter standalone, like they had been doing or what we thought, it's like, okay, it, it is what it is. We've had that same argument. We've gone back and forth a million times over, hey man, free country, you're a private organization, you do what you want within the limits of the law. But when you become an extension of the federal government, as far as who to censor, what to censor, what information back and forth, that's a violation of First Amendment rights. And we're seeing it here. We can get into a little bit later as far as their Arizona elections and this and that, where you've got direct messages from Katie Hobbs straight to Twitter. This is misinformation. You need to censor this. You need to delete this. You need to blacklist this person. You need to shadow ban this person. And you know what? Here, here's what I love. The, the, the excuse is, well, you know, she hadn't declared herself as a candidate yet. Oh, so, so really, so you, in January, you don't think that she kind of knew that she was running. She was, you know, whether she declared herself to be a candidate or not for, for you know, governor, uh, she was still the secretary of state for the state of Arizona. So that's the point we're trying to make. What What is mind boggling to me is that more people don't care. And what you're starting to see is the mainstream media was in on it, obviously. And their answer to it is, you know, it goes back to this control thing. Well, they control 99% of what's out there as far as what you see and what you hear. And I throw in Fox News in there as well because they're just as dirty. They control 99% of what you see and what you hear. And you know what their coverage on this thing has been? Zero. Nothing. Nada. Even when you look at Fox News, the people that are really covering it and going into it are your editorials. Those are the, you know, your Tucker Carlson's, your, your opinion shows they're covering when you actually look at the news, like who's covering this on the right and the left. Nobody is because they're complicit. They know what's going on. It's no different than the Hunter. You know what? Hunter Biden laptop. We just won't report it. Hey, the, um, protests going on, going on in Iran. We just won't report it. Protests that are going on in China. We just won't report it. They know they control the narrative that way, and they control the, the majority of the information that the majority of Americans are going to see. And it goes back to what I've said a million times. It's not about Coke beating Pepsi, Pepsi being Coke. It's Coke and Pepsi keeping everybody else out of the game. And the Republicans and Democrats know that. The mainstream media knows that. As far as what Elon Musk is doing, you know, there's another piece of this is that uh, cuz I don't believe in everything that he says and I don't you know I don't I'm not a supporter of everything that he says. He does hold a lot of leverage though because last time I checked he's sending some government stuff up in space, right? And he's providing a lot of government services that that people need. Uh, but you also have to remember he's now the owner of Twitter and there's also a marketing piece. You know, he, he does this stuff and he, and he creates a lot of engagement. And it's like the, it's become the, I'm moving to Canada, right? I'm moving to Canada if Trump's elected. And what happens? I'm getting off Twitter if Elon buys this. And, and what happened? Nothing, right? The fact that they were able to fire, what, 75% of the, uh, of the workforce or whatever it was and still operate the same way, if not better, that right there, that, I mean, it, dude, it's, it's, it's identical to our, to our federal government. But, you know, I'll throw it to Josh for, for, you know, his take on this thing. 
it just, it really upsets me that more people aren't upset about it. Don't really understand the issue. And what I think for me, and I've said this a million times before, uh, I, I will continue to go more and more to Twitter because it's for those independent journalists that I'm actually able to get some news on that you don't see anywhere else because CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, they know that they control 99% of the, of the story out there. They know they control, not, even when you get into Tucker Carlson's, hey, let's talk about Tucker Carlson and the, uh, the, the Hunter Biden uh, letter of recommendation for a son to get into college. You don't think there's some ties there? You know, it goes back to McCarthy. It goes to all of these guys and gals. They're all in cahoots, you know, and it's frustrating for us that are independent conservatives. It's, uh, you know, I'm starting to become like Josh Blackpilled here where it's like, eh, man, you take too many red pills, dude. You start going down this rabbit hole and you realize that left and right. I mean, you know, they've debunked it, that the whole political horseshoe thing, you know, the farther left, the farther right you go, you come back to the center and they say, oh, that's not true. Yeah, it, it kind of is, you know, and, and it, it, it's disheartening. But I think. I mean, Josh, are, are you, does it shock you that more people aren't upset that the federal government is, is controlling free speech or, or does it upset you more that more people just don't care about the issue or know what the issue is? No, it doesn't surprise me that more people aren't upset, but it does make me upset that people are more upset. Um, if that, if that makes sense. Right. And again, I go back and we, we, we have had this conversation just, you know, ad nauseum, like, again, go all the way back to the revolution. The vast majority of colonists were loyalists. They were Tories, right? Their degree of participation and their degree of support varied. Um, you know, some people were, you know, actively supported, you know, the, the crown, other people passively supported the crown. Some people just didn't want to be bothered with it. Right. But they didn't actively support the Patriots. They didn't actively support the revolution, you know, the, the fight against the crown, um, that hasn't changed by and large, that has not changed the majority. And, and, you know, in Luke's has said this, you know, time and time again, the majority of Americans are comfortable and they don't want anything to jeopardize that, you know, that, that level of comfort. And, you know, you know, and Luke's pointed out, hey, you know, really the only freedoms that we really truly have these days are, you know, which sugary cereal, uh, you know, we we want to pick out at the at the grocery store. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, a lot of Americans, you know, are are not upset about this because by and large, the majority of Americans are all a bunch of peas. Right. Um, it it does upset me that more people aren't upset about this because like guys, like this is, this is significant. Like this is your future. Right. And it only, it only gets worse from here. And it, it is going to get to a point, you know, and like you're saying, you know, the left wing and the right wing, they're attached to the same bird. I've tried to, t I've tried to tell you guys, you know, this, and you guys know this. And, you know, then you, then you get upset with me and you yell at me when I say, I'm not voting for any of these idiots, you know, because they're all the same people. They're all the same person. Right. Um, you know, Dan Crenshaw is no different than Liz Cheney, who is no different than, you know, Pocahontas, you know, or, or, or whoever. Right. Um, so when you, you know, when you, you, you look at that, it you can't vote your way out of this after a certain point. Right. You can vote your way into it. You can vote your way into communism, into you can vote your way into socialism, but there's only one way out, and we all know what that is. You have to shoot your way out eventually, right? It might not be our kids. It might be our grandkids, but the road that we are on, there is there, there are no, there, the off-ramps, we're running out of off-ramps. We don't have a whole lot more left. You know, it's like that sign, hey, last road before, last exit before the toll, we're coming up on that very, very quickly. And the toll, the toll on this one, it's going to be blood. That's just what it's going to be. And people are like, oh, Josh is crazy. You know, Josh doesn't know what he's talking Josh is a madman. We had this conversation last week, you know, pretty animated, you know, <laughs> around, a, around a heater with, a, you know, a couple of, you know, some so of our mutual friends. And it's like, hey, it's like... There's only one ending. This isn't a pick your own adventure book, guys. This is a movie that has multiple endings and you just kind of get to pick the one you like, 
there's only one ending to this and it's going to be bad. And our kids or our grandkids are going to have to deal with that. Right. And it's going to be generally kind of our fault that, you know, it, it, it got to this, um, you know, uh, having a conversation with, with, with another one of our mutual friends the, the other day, um, you know, and he was kind of down, you know, for these same reasons, you know, he's looking at the, you know, the state of the union and he's pretty, you know, he's pretty down about how, you know, we got to where we're at and, and blah, blah. And I, I just kind of had to frame it out this way because this is what, this is how I, I, I'm starting to look at it. And only because this is the only thing that's keeping me, you know, somewhat sane is, you know, you go back, every generation has had a fight that they've had to, you know, un, you know, they there, there's a cross that they've had to bear for their freedom. Right. And it started with the revolution. You know, our grandparents had, you know, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan. They had to deal with that. They had to address that. You know, our parents had Vietnam, the Cold War that they had to deal with. Right. Trying to keep communism at bay and keep communism from spreading. Our generation, we had to deal with Islamic terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism. Right. Now, that came at a price. Right. Because we took our eye off of, you know, those strategic competitors our kids are going to have the fight, you know, to deal with, to try and preserve their freedom, but it's going to be here at home and they're going to have to figure out a way to do that. And they're going to have to figure out a way to deal with that. We can't do that for them. We kind of, you know, we didn't, we didn't necessarily help set the table that well, but you know, there are, you know, a certain percentage of the population who are trying, um, you know, so that, that's kind of the way I look at it to kind of keep me, you know, keep me from going sane because, you know, we're all going to be, you know, hopefully we're going to be, you know, 70, 80 years old, you know, still trying to fight the good fight, you know, to, to no avail, I'm afraid. And it's going to be up to, it's going to be up to our kids, you know, to, to pick up the baton and, you know, and, and to go forward. So I don't know, we're going to, I'm going to get us banned by YouTube or something for <laughs> you know, probably sounding crazy, but Luke, what you got? <laughs> Well, it wouldn't be the first time. So yeah, Josh and I got a little spicy uh, last week. It, it was it was kind of funny because those those mutual friends are also listeners. We appreciate y'all listening. You know who you are. And uh, one of them said uh, at the spicy moment, you "Should make this one into a podcast." Because I'm sitting there kind of pushing Josh's buttons and saying stuff to him that you know uh, we only said through text. I was like, "Let's see how this plays," you know, it, it verbally rather than through text. And uh, <laughs> it was fun because he's pushing my buttons too and. Like it was getting kind of heated. And then, you know, uh, the friend took over and gave his two cents. And Josh kind of shoulder checks me and like slaps me in the, the chest. He goes, you MF for pushing my buttons. <laughs> it was it was fun, man. It was a lot of fun to get together and, and talk face to face like that. It was a lot of fun. I, I believe that Josh is, is uh, uh, with what you said there at the at, at your last comments, Josh, I believe that you are uh, coping with. Uh, something that would drive you insane if you actually saw the reality of it. And what I mean by that is I see what's happening in this country more like the disintegration and the fall of the Roman Empire. I think it's happening very slowly. It's crumbling very slowly. There will be pockets of violence here and there, but it will not be, I, in my opinion, uh, it will not be a massive conflagration of violence and, and everything will be sorted out. Uh, uh, I think it'll be a slow thing that only historians could see coming. And what I mean by you're, you're, you're staving off the madness is the old, I think it's the Greek, the Greek tale of Cassandra who could see truth, you know, coming like we're, you know, like we said, we, we called this, we called that. And it's maddening that no one around us could see it. And that's the tale of Cassandra is there are a few, you know, the Bible, we call them prophets or whatever. We're not prophets, but it's just like, the story is like Elijah in the Bible was a prophet. He would say, hey, this is going to happen. And no one would listen to him. And he was seen as like a madman. It drove him crazy. Same as Cassandra in Greek mythology. I think it's Greek. It might be Roman. But uh, she could see everything coming and no one would listen to her. And it drove her absolutely mad. So I think Josh is staving off, <laughs> staving off complete insanity by, say, by, by believing that this is going to come to a head and we're going to come to blows about this. And I'm not insulting Josh. It's more of a it's it's more of a uh, a jab at him like I was doing the other day. 
So one thing I would, uh, that same millennial I was talking Whatever. about, or <laughs> that same millennial I was talking about earlier, occasionally she surprises me and she sent me a text and I'll read it. Uh, what's your opinion on the new hotness of the Supreme Court debating if website designers should be able to deny services for, for uh, gay weddings or not? I said, that's a complex issue. I generally side with a private entity's liberty, but that's a little, but this is a little more complex than that. Maybe we'll cover this on the next episode. So the case she's talking about is the Supreme Court is hearing an argument on whether gay or whether wedding website creator, uh, web designer, in other words, can refuse same-sex couples. And I'll just, I'll just read this real quick. Lori Smith, a website designer, uh, filed suit seeking to block the Colorado Civil Rights Commission from a force enforcing the state's public accommodation law known as the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act to stop her from refusing to create uh, wedding uh, websites for same-sex couples, same sex couples. This goes back to the wedding cake. If y'all, everybody remembers that. Uh, so Smith alleged uh, that same sex marriage, same sex marriage goes against her Christian faith and belief that marriage is only between one man and one woman. She further seeks to be able to post a statement that she will only create messages or more specifically platforms for those messages that are consistent with her faith. Now, I will stick with what I personally believe about liberty. Um, do I? with liberty with respect to the government enforcing more morality, the government, I, you know, if I wish this guy Phil triple horn, I'll call him out by name. Cause he doesn't listen. Anybody who doesn't listen. I'm going to call out by name. No, I don't care. But he I'm and I used to go you. back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hero, but he, he and I used to go back and forth. Cause I used to believe in my youth that yes, government should enforce morality in certain cases. And I, I was wrong about that. And I realized that as I grew up and uh, became more critically minded. And he, he was right. The government enforcing morality is, is not a good thing in my book because that leaves it to the government to decide what morality is. I, I think that's wrong. Uh, now, do I believe that you know, whites only water fountains, whites only restaurants are a good thing? Absolutely not. No, that is bad. That's evil. But is that on the government to enforce that? I don't know. Same thing with this, uh, with this whole thing about baking the cake or designing the website. When the government compels you, compels a U.S. citizen to go against their own beliefs, I think that's a bad thing because that gives the government way too much power. I personally believe that Again, the market will sort that shit out. At the end of the day, the market will sort it out. Oh, you have a business that doesn't allow Jews inside? Oh, well, this business over here is going to open a, open a shop that's going to cater to Jews only, and they're going to run your, your shop out of business. Same thing with the gay marriage thing. Same thing with blacks only. Now, people listen to this, and it, it touches nerves. And they're like, well, Luke believes. No, Luke, Luke believes it's wrong. Luke believes that's evil and that's a bad way to think. But at the same time, I trust the citizens to make the choice. I do not trust the government to compel morality. So that that's kind of where I stand on that. Um, yeah. So, and that kind of ties in with the defense of marriage act a little bit. If you guys, uh, I think you guys are a little bit smarter on that than I am. I listened to a few things that Ben Shapiro has said, but he kind of goes off the deep end. So I don't know if you want to talk about that, but Roger, what are your thoughts on the, the the wedding cake designer and the web designer? Should they be, should the government force them and compel them to to serve, you know, anyone according to the Colorado Anti Discrimination Act? So I listened to the argument. I listened to snippets of the Supreme Court, court argument, and then actually heard from the uh, the defendant's uh, lawyer. Which, by the way, she has provided services for gay and lesbian couples and, and this and that. It's just this specific website service that she doesn't do because she has she specifically creates something. And it goes beyond compels. I think part of the argument that her lawyer used was it's not just providing a service or letting somebody eat or serving dinner or, or whatever. You are forcing me to create something that is against my religious belief which to, in my opinion takes it up to a whole new level. Uh, the, the problem becomes, well, where is the limit on that? Because we've gotten to the point now where you've got just like genders, you've got 10,000 genders, according to some, you get 10,000 religions. Well, what if your religion is, you know, you don't like black people, you don't like Asians, you don't like white people. 
uh, yeah, private business. Can you, can you refuse services? Can you refuse to create something? Where is that fine line? You know, and they, it was actually, I heard some of the banner back and forth. I, I should have pulled it up before this, but I know you were uh, going to bring this up, but I think it was Alito and Sotomayor and Sotomayor, she went down the road and I'm, and I'm kind of paraphrasing some of this, so it may not be exact, but she was talking about Santa Claus. Well, what if you're playing Santa Claus and, and you believe it's only supposed to be white people and, and you refuse to have, or you refuse to take pictures of, you know, a, a black kid or an Asian kid sitting on Santa Claus's lap or, or whatever. And I didn't hear the answer to it, but I heard the phrase of that question. And then Alito comes back uh, immediately and says, well, okay, let's say in the Santa Claus scenario that a Nazi comes up and wants to take a picture. Can you force somebody that, to take a picture uh, of somebody who doesn't believe that? So, you know, it, it, is, it is very tricky because on the surface of things, the government should not force you, should not be able to force you to create anything at all. And I think that, you know, there is a nuance there. And I think that's what the prosecution, because especially when you get these Supreme Court cases, it is extremely nuanced, like we've talked about before. And, and I think they brought that up because there is a difference between forcing you to create something and make something versus providing a, a, an ordinary service. So I'm, I'm like, Luke, I'm all about, hey, man, government stay out of it. Uh, to me, it, it, it's a no brainer. I, I'd like to believe it's a no brainer who knows, because again, you don't hear all the arguments and, and it is so nuanced, but I want to ask Josh, cause I think he believes probably along the same lines with us, but where is that line at? Uh, because you know, I, I think there's this, you, you always talk about what a realistic person, right? Or whatever the term is, the legal term would, would, would understand or agree with, or go along with, or, or believe. And you apply that to most court cases, but then when you throw in, well, well, I can believe in whatever I, you know, have whatever religious belief that I want to believe in or have. And my religion says that I don't, I don't serve minorities because white people are the whatever, or, Hey, I'm Asian. I don't serve any other race than Asians. My, my religious belief tells me that that's what I follow. So I, you know, coming from your, your opinion or asking for your opinion, where do you think the line is with that as far as private organizations, private businesses. Where the line is is where the show government should get involved. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, I mean, should somebody, should somebody, so I can say, Hey, I'm a, I'm a minority. I'm, I'm Asian. And uh, my religious belief, because I can have whatever religion I want, because I can claim whatever identity I want. This is that slippery slope we go down, right? right. I can claim whatever I want. So my religion says that I just don't serve white people. Now, obviously I think like Luke said, that will work itself out in the market. But yeah. should somebody be able to claim that? Yeah, I think so. And again, let the free let the free market work it out. I, mean, I don't think it's right. But at the end of the day, who am I to make you do something against your you know your 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 staunchly held religious belief? Why don't they ever? Here's a question: Why don't people? Why don't the alphabet people ever go into a Muslim? own business and demand that they do it, that they build them a website or bake them a cake. Why don't they do that? You never hear about that. It's always, they go into a Christian business. Why not go into a, why don't they go into a Muslim business and do that? They, Cause they know shit I, is real when you do that. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> You know, at the end of the day is, you know, and, and again, you're right. You can, I mean, we can take this into, you know, a level of absurdity. I don't, I forget what state it was, but remember the guy, they were, they allowed him to take his driver's license photo with, you know, basically a colander on his head. Cause he was a, he was a pastafarian, right? You guys remember that? And he convinced him like, this is oh, my yeah. religion. Okay. Well, I mean, it, I mean, the, the level of absurdity knows no bounds. With, with this stuff, but I, I, I truly believe that a private business should be able to do what they want to a private. It, it's no different than a private business saying, these are my prices. Let's talk bourbon, right? Your private business. If you want to say, uh, you know, just last week I saw, I saw a bottle of EHT barrel proof. They wanted four nine three ninety nine or four ninety nine for it. They're a private business. They can set their price, whatever they want. I don't have to buy it. I can, you know, I can walk out of that store and say, fine, I'm not buying anything here. 
even even if you're you know something's in there that is reasonably priced, I'm going to take my business elsewhere, and I'm going to tell everybody I know don't go into that store because they charge exorbitant prices, right? Or you know the people are assholes, and guess what? My friends won't go. You know they won't go spend money at that business, and the free market will eventually work itself out, right? And, and that's what I and that's what I really believe. I don't think you should be able to, you know, walk into any business and demand that they capitulate. And, you know, to you and they, you know, abdicate their religious beliefs or because, because I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you that it was because this was the same thing with the, with the baker in Colorado. Those people intentionally went in there to do that. It wasn't the first baker they went to. It wasn't like, well, this day, these guys make the best cakes in town. That's who we're going to. They went in there intentionally to cause a scene. They went in there, you know, the whole website thing. It was done intentionally. Right. They're just trying to cause a scene. They want their 15 minutes of fame and it's all BS. Well, I don't even think the, I, I think the people suing her, it's not even a customer. It was like, it's not the ACLU. Yeah. It's one of those like anti defamation yeah. league or whatever. Right. Yep. That theoretically so, somebody could, could ask for this service. It's all, it's, it's all nonsense. Right. And so today, you know, also, so today Joe Biden signed into law, the, um, you know, the new marriage bill that protects same sex marriages and uh, in- interracial marriages, which were under threat anyway. Right. Which was pretty, ri- pretty ridiculous, um, you know. And so which so this bill, I forget the name of it, uh, but it basically it got rid of Doma. It basically got rid of Doma. Doma is, you know, been overwritten, um, you know, and Biden made the comment. Biden made the comment that, you know. Alphabet people were being thrown out of restaurants. That's how bad it is. That's why this legislation was needed. I have not heard of one instance of an alphabet person being tossed out of a restaurant for being an alphabet person. I have heard of conservatives being chased out of restaurants because they were being hounded because they were conservatives. I've heard of unvaccinated people being kicked out of restaurants and business for being unvaccinated. Right. But I haven't heard of an alphabet person being kicked out of a restaurant simply for being an alphabet person. I don't understand. I don't understand it. It, Let the free market sort it out. That's what the free market's for, because, you know, freedom that's comfortable and nice is rarely freedom. So that's uh, that's my thought on it. Yeah. And you know what? That's a great point. Griner. You know why we got Griner back? Even though 99.999% of Americans didn't know that name before she got rolled up in Russia because she violated their law? Because she's an alphabet person. That's why. We left the Marine behind, but we got her back because that's a big PR win. And we, dude, we gave, dude, we gave them the merchant of death. Like we basically traded Carlos the Jackal for like a triple a like second string shortstop that's Dude, like that was the equivalent of that deal the left can no longer say one word about gun control well they, yeah. they have lost all of that you God, cannot say yeah. one word about gun control that you know people talk about that victor bout uh and they say oh well the the, the movie the lord of war was based on him no, he was far worse than that. If you've seen that movie, he was far worse than that guy. I mean, as far as like damage to uh, U.S. national security, U.S. interests, and just overall violence in the world, that guy was a piece, is a piece of work. He was a piece of work until he was let out. Now he's going back to Russia to start up his, his old ways. Uh, yeah, that dude, uh, I could see the narrative forming too. And I almost uh, messaged you guys this uh, this. <laughs> This MSNBC article I saw where it was like Brittany Griner sent a very clear message to Victor Bout on the tarmac when they passed each other. And they were trying to spin it like she tried to shake Bout's hand and Bout's like, this is a good person. And it's like, oh, so now we're spinning the narrative that, oh, Bout's not all that bad. I was like, this is where it's going to go. And then that turned around when he got on with uh, uh, Maria Bettina, the the Russian spy, the hot Russian spy, who's now a journalist over there, uh, interviewed him. And he's like all in on Russia and Ukraine, like all in on it. It's like, okay, well, that narrative's gone. But, you know, 
<laughs> and like a Whalen, is it Paul Whalen, the Marine over there? You know, what the left yeah. is trying to latch onto with him is, oh, well, he was dishonorably discharged. So therefore this and that, but dude, it's, it's so tough to watch this. And, and Josh is, is hit it on the head. It's like the only reason that she is released is because it was a big win. It's a big win. And it doesn't make me personally, or I imagine any other service member who is not in a protected class, if you will, feel better about their own, you know, government leaving them to rot because, you know, uh, you know where I'm going with that. It's just like if I was in that situation or if I was going into a situation where that could possibly happen, it's like, well, you know, ha ha the faith in the government is eroded. Faith. Go ahead, Roger. Well, what makes it even worse is that the initial NBC report that came out was that the administration was given either or. Yes. Whelan or Griner. Now. Or nothing. Or nothing, right? So you've got one of three choices that you could that you can make. Now, I'm glad, on one hand, I'm glad an American came home. My point back to our media and Twitter and all that other stuff and put your tinfoil hat on or whatever, I believe somebody from the administration reached out to that NBC reporter and was like, no, 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 no. Your source is wrong. It was Griner or nothing. And then immediately went back and deleted it like a couple minutes later. I mean, and come on. Shadow, so, yeah, yeah, come on, man. They, they absolutely shadow edited that. They went back and shadow edited it. And that's that's proven. You can go back and look at the at the web files. I saw a website on that today that they I can't remember which outlet it was that went back in a and it and excuse me, did that. Uh, it's it's a it's a sad state of affairs. And you know, this I don't know, is this a worse deal than the Taliban five for Bo Bergdahl? I don't know. I mean Brittany Griner for Victor Bout, wow. I mean, that's that's something. It, it, you know, it's like everybody's saying this is the first WNBA trade that anyone's ever cared about. I think that is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. And what, what's the guy with the gambling website? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, uh, he's a – oh, what's his it's name? It's uh, Dan um... – Shoot. Uh, I know you. I know you're talking about. He was on Rogan, and he's all over Instagram. Yeah, he, yeah, man. he and he and Bill Burr have a really good point, and it's 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 questionable who who came up with this point first. You know, Brittany Griner. For those of you who don't know, and I don't blame you if you don't know. The only reason I know her is because she played for Baylor, who's in the Big Twelve, and I usually don't pay attention to that. But she's like nine feet tall, and she's like one of the first females to dunk in an NBA or NBA in an NCAA tournament or something like that. And that was a big deal back there. That's the only reason I know her only reason. And, you know, she goes to the WNBA and it's like, God, if you've watched the WNBA, it's just so not good. It, it, it's so not, uh, no, no, it's not Dan Bilzerian. It's the other guy, uh, barstool sports. Uh, I thought, uh, uh barstool sport in that David Portnoy. Portnoy, yeah, it's Portnoy or Bill, Bill Bird. I'm getting, to, I'm getting to what I'm getting to their point. It's my my point is this: is that the WNBA is boring. It's super boring. It's awful. It's not fun to watch. It's you know people want to see jumping high. People want to see performance. And Bill Burr and Dave Portnoy's point is, you know, people want to say, oh, they want to cry sexism, sexism, sexism. Well, it's like okay, females make up 51 percent of the population, so maybe you should go out and support the WNBA. You know, it would be if all the females went out and, and uh, supported that, you know, it'd be all good. So I'll kick it to Roger for his thoughts on Griner. No, it's, it's the same thing. I don't, you know, I don't know. There's a, you're in a lose, lose situation. Even when you talk about the Taliban five, when you talk about, I mean, it's just, you're in a bad situation all in all. My whole thing, whether you're, it, it's tough because they both broke laws. I mean, from what I understand, you know, well, with Griner, it's because she had like CBD oil or something, right? And I think with uh, Whelan, he had, um, was it marijuana or something like that? But I think he had, some, I think it was a narcotics charge, but they ended up charging him with like espionage or something like that. I'd actually have to look that up or whatever. 
So, you know, part of the problem is like, hey, one, you probably don't want to go to Russia. That's just, I mean, that's just my thought. And two, if you do go over there, uh, I'm definitely not taking anything illegal. I mean, the, the reality is I'm not taking vitamins with me over there, right? There, China, Iran, those type of places, I'm literally going with the clothes on my back and the clothes on my back will probably be a white or black Hanes t-shirt and a white or black or red uh, Fruit of the Loom shorts. There would be nothing derogatory on my shirt. There would be no spellings. There'd be nothing. I mean, because you got to know where you're going. And you know the WNBA knows that as well. You know, so it's hard to get, it's hard for me to have any sympathy because it's like, you broke another country's laws, man. Yeah, but part of that, a large part of that is entitlement. Because, you know, she's a black female. She's part of the alphabet people. And she's in the United States. I mean, she, dude, she's entitled, right? And wherever she goes in the world, she's like, you can't talk to me like that because, you know, you're, you know, you got to, you, you're not woke. You got to be woke. Now, you let know, me ask you this. Can she flip the script on this? So we all know that, you know, during the NBA or WNBA, she was taking a knee and it was Black Lives Matter and hates the U.S. government, won't stand for the, the Pledge of Allegiance, yada, 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 or the national anthem. Can she actually, now she's back home, because there's already been reports, she went up there and shook every crew member's hand and this and that, and you got to know, they they were like, she asked them, you know, their first name and whoop-de-doo, but can she, cause I think I see it, but can she actually flip the script on this a little bit? And maybe it's genuine. Okay. Because I think that nine months in a Russian jail might do that to you. It might change your perspective a little bit. Uh, can she flip the script and maybe get some redemption in the eyes of the American people where hey, she's like, you know what? I was wrong. If she was smart, she, well, if the WNBA was smart, they would totally push that narrative, totally push that narrative. It's like, you need to flip the script on this. And, you know, at least we'll get maybe a few games, viewerships, sponsorships and stuff like that. Because, man, Josh, when she goes back, more people will tune in. There will be more than two people. That's their usual viewing audience. Uh, will tune in because now she's back. So, I mean, from a business standpoint, if her agent, and if the WNBA isn't talking to her agent, WNBA and other corporations, by the way, aren't talking to her agent being like, Hey, we need to do something with this. Well, then they're fools and they may well be fools, but, uh, I, you know, I, I would be surprised if they don't parlay this into something. Now, who knows Bill, what that'll be, Josh, do you think, uh, they could parlay it into what Roger is saying, or do you think they'll just go the other way with it and be like, you know, uh, make it something political. I, I don't know. What do you think? They'll make it something political. There is no way that the WNBA will spin it like Roger is saying, because then they have to come out. They have to come out at that point and say, America is good. America is not that bad. You guys think you have it bad here, man. You haven't been to other countries. Like we, like we have it really good here. And that means that America is good. And that, because you look at the majority of the people who watch the WNBA and support the WNBA are not of that mindset. Right. And so, they come out and they they go along with that narrative. They are going to get crushed by their own people. The left will eat them alive, right? And we talked about this. We, we we talked about this last week. It's like, why do most businesses, and you know, especially large corporations, why do they support and toe the line of the left? Because they are afraid of the wrath of the left, not only from the government, but the left in the private sector as well. They are afraid of that because the right is basically, you know, they're, they're all hat and no cattle. And the WM dude, the WNBA would get eaten alive by their own. The snake would eat his tail in a second. If they try and take the, you know, they, they try and take the, the route that Rogers suggests. I don't know. They get destroyed by their, by their own people. But you are seeing some of this stuff come back around. Like when you look at what's going on with Disney and the new CEO where it's like, hey, you know what? You go woke, you go broke. And, and there's been some instances where some pretty big companies, man, you know, what will be curious is to see what Adidas does, right? With Kanye has gone completely off the rails uh, to where I don't even know what the hell he's talking about. Because normally you're like, eh, the guy's just trying to get some PR and free press and, you know, whatever. And it's like. Yeah, he's a little off his rocker and like his Yeezys or whatever. That was like 50% of their profits, man. 
you know, and at the end of the day with most of these companies, money talks. And so it just makes me wonder, you know, with the, and, and, and you're probably right, Josh, I want to believe that they use this to say, Hey, here's how we pivot. Here's how we pivot and maybe make some money, but they're already coming out and, and blaming that. You're an idealist. Well, because she's, because she, probably, but because she's a black woman, you know, the, she, the fact that she's a black woman is the reason why she was put in that position in the first place it, because it, it, she has to go overseas to play basketball. They'll spin it. They'll spin it and be like, well, if she was white, she would only been in there for, she would have been out in 30 days, right? It's because she was black and an alphabet person. They left her in there longer. Well, she was hard. black and underpaid, which is why she even had to go to Russia to play in the first it, place. It, Whoa, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, I just, I, I really think that if they were smart, which we all three of them know they're not, but if I was a political operative for the Democrat party and all this stuff, and I, I, you know, Josh, you can even agree with this. If you were smart and you were, paid enough to be a political operative for the Democrat party. Wouldn't it be wise to spend this in the lead up to the next election that, well, now that Biden is president, America is great. You see the progress we're making, you know, you see how, you know, now you can be a Patriot as long as Biden's in charge. <laughs> I'll leave that for you to say, Josh. It's just, it seems like a, like a good political strategy to use her as a pawn to gin up like independence, to be like, yeah, America is great now. Look what we just did. Isn't this awesome? But they won't do that. And this is where I'm going to agree with you as much as it pains me to do it. They'll spin it as some intersectional divisional BS, you know, but if they were smart, they might, you know, go along the lines of what Roger says. And I think that's what, because Roger's smarter than the average political operative. I would say so. So on that, first off, like I said, I'm going to disagree with you simply because you told me I have to agree with you. Um, but no, I do. I no, I, I do agree that that would be smart in, in all honesty. Like, I do agree that would be smart. Right. Because that it, it was a huge PR win for the Biden administration. And they they have an opportunity to play this, you know, to to play it the right way to try and try and draw back some of those independent voters who just watched their 401ks, you know, circle the drain over the last, you know, year, right. They have an opportunity to do that. I'm just saying they won't because their own people will destroy them as soon as they, as soon as they try and say, you know, America's good, you know, and, and now they could take the tack and it would be hilarious to say for them to come out and say Biden has made America great again. Like make America, it was like, oh, so MAGA is a thing, huh? Right. So, so it was a thing. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't think they'll do it because they do their own people will, will absolutely eat them alive. So I've got uh, a more important question. I'll, I'll throw it over to Luke first and then kick it over to Josh. So it's kind of funny because I think several months ago we were talking about the liver King, right? And the liver King was, if you don't follow this guy on Instagram, so basically this guy is yoked, right? I mean, he is completely yoked. You, you know, if you were to see him on the street, you think he was an operator, that type of stuff, that yoked. Um, and he lives, but I think, I, and, and I, I don't follow him. So I'm just, some of this is what I recall from reading. He's got like these nine tenants of like, this is how the caveman lived, right? And the caveman ate, raw organs and this and that. And it's funny because you have all these historians that are like, yeah, so cavemen, not one caveman was as yoked as, as you are. Most of them were, were fairly lean and a little bit scrawny and didn't eat a whole lot. Right. <laughs> and when they did get the chance to eat, they, they ate as much as they could and, you know, uh, and whatever. Um, so th apparently there was some email traffic back and forth that went, uh, that, that was basically, shine some light on his actual steroid use, which wouldn't be a big deal except for the fact that he claimed that he was all natural. And, and anybody, any of us, anybody has played any sports, has anything to do, has one athletic bone in their body looks like, okay, you don't get that way being all natural. And we've known some folks that are like top of the genetic pyramid, right? That, hey, they're not that way. Um, so anyway, he gets called. It looks like he's putting in about, you know, 13,000. Well, at first it was $13,000 a month worth the worth of steroids or, or whatever. Now, I think the last thing that I saw him, he was saying he could actually buy a car with how much he's putting into his body. Well, with under Biden's economy, I guess maybe it's 40 or 50,000, or maybe it's a Tesla and it's $65,000 uh, a month or whatever. One, I will give this guy balls because 
dude, he's still putting out videos, man. I mean, this guy has gone on a couple podcasts. Uh, he's been pretty straightforward. And I guess, you know, you, you look at how, uh, you know, Lance Armstrong played out and how that went on for years. And then you take somebody like the liver King, which dude, I couldn't care less if the guy was using roids or not. Like we all knew he was using roids. You know, you're just, you know, I have a problem when you're a fraud and you're making money off of telling a lie and living a fraud, which brings me to my question. So Joe Rogan mentioned the other day, he got in the, the conversation about the liver King and he talked about the rock. So what do you, the rock is 50 years old. Yep. Yoked is all get out. The guy's on steroids, right? I mean, is there yes. any, is there any question, any doubt in your mind that this, that the rock is on steroids? No, 100%. Because he's, he's in his fifties. He, he's in his fifties. And it's like, so Roger, you listen to the same podcast I did with Derek from more plates, more dates. That's a, nope. you know, yeah. uh, that guy, Derek, uh, and it's kind of a, you know, and he covered it while he talked to Joe Rogan, more plates, more dates. He started out this YouTube channel when he was in his twenties and, uh, he has a very specific, uh, you know, thing he's, he's talking about. But now if you listen to that, he goes into the chemistry of all this stuff. This guy is very, very, very knowledgeable, very smart about, uh, you know, the different types of steroids you can put into your body basically and how to, how to look a certain way. And one of the things he does is he'll like, uh, he'll go down the list. It's like, how did Hugh Jackman look like he did in the like the second to last Wolverine movie? Because that is unnatural. And he's like, now I can't prove that he did this, but this is what a human being could put in their body to make them look like this. And this would be the effects of those certain, you know, hormones and androgens that they could put in their body, so on and so forth. And one of the things he said, and this ties into the rock and the liver king, is you know, The Rock has actually, they talked about this on the podcast, The Rock has only actually said once that he does not use steroids, and that was years ago. So The Rock has PR people and all this stuff, and before he does an interview, they make sure, and they sign agreements that say, you will not ask about this, and if you do, you cannot publish this interview, right? So years ago, The Rock said he went on one cycle, and it made him sick, and it all this stuff, and so he's never done it again. First of all, I don't believe that. So, but, but, my point is he's only said it once. Okay. Liver King <laughs> said repeatedly that he did not use them and he credited his plan. It's like a, uh, like Roger said, it's a caveman thing. It's like the ancestral, the nine ancestral tenets is, is what the liver King follows. And it's, it's all this nonsense. He goes, he credits his physique and God, I'm telling y'all go look this dude up. He, you cannot look like that. Naturally, and I think we covered this a few podcasts ago. I said this guy is not natural, but he developed his whole business model on this. In those emails that Roger was talking about, he actually was working with a you know a hormone specialist and gave the hormone specialist his plan. He's like, in 14 months, I want to look like this. Give me what ever I need to look like this. I'll do the work and I'll eat right and I'll work out hard, but I need to look like this. That was his whole business plan to push it forward. So in his, uh, in his little video that he did where he apologized, his justification was, and he handled it better than Armstrong initially did. He's like, Hey, look, you know, I know I did this. I effed up, you know, but I was doing it for a better cause. You know, I can't take it back, but I was doing it for a better cause to, you know, uh, it was all about male suicide between the ages of 18 and 32 or something, which, okay, you're handling it better than that. Your PR person is good. But back to Derek, more plates, more dates. His thing is, you know, if you're developing a business model upon a lie, that's when it crosses the line. And what he was bringing up was like Chris Hemsworth. I love Chris Hemsworth. He's great. I think he's awesome, man. Thor, it's great. But you know what Chris Hemsworth did is he sold his workout plan for the latest Thor movie to some whatever, some business. And he sold it for an exorbitant amount of money. And it's like, this is what you need to do to look like me in that movie. What he did not include was whatever cycle he was on and whatever drugs he was on to get him to look like that. Because, I mean, come on. I mean, the guy is in really good shape, just just like The Rock. You know, they're, they're in really good shape, but man... There's a reason, like Roger said, that cavemen didn't look like that. There's a reason that dudes in the 1940s didn't look like that, 1950s, so on and so forth. It's like there are genetic freaks out there like Ronnie Coleman, uh, the Mr. Olympia, the eight-time Mr. Olympia. When he was natural, 
he was freaking enormous and he looked like a freak of nature, but he could not win the Mr. Olympia. He was placed like eighth, seventh. And Ronnie Coleman, I, I admire the guy. He's very open and honest. He's like, yeah, as soon as I went on steroids, I started winning. And it's like, just be open, <laughs> man. Just be honest. And don't, don't sell me something without telling me the whole truth. And that's, that's the whole thing with the, with the liver King. And yeah, that Derek, you know, more plates, more dates. You know, we were talking about this earlier on a, uh, I don't want to share too much information, but I was talking with a couple of friends earlier today about, you know, testosterone replacement therapy and how I believe it's a good thing. And, uh, but it, yet everybody's body's different. You need to, you know, take risk factors into consideration, but it's like the thing with liver King is like, yeah, like Roger said, so what? Everybody knew he's on steroids. He's not a competitive athlete. He's not Barry Bonds, right? He's not Barry Bonds. He's not cheating, right? Never he's tested just, positive. <laughs> he's, just, he's just putting himself out there. But just, dude, just be honest. If you, can get to be, if you can get to looking like that in a healthy way, wouldn't it be more beneficial for everyone? It's just like, hey, this is the healthiest way to look like this without damaging your body. I don't know. But what we called it, man, you heard it on Culper's Canteen Cup first. You've never heard of the Liver King. We said it. It's like that dude's on roids. And hey, we were right again. So, Josh, Liver King, what do you think? <laughs> Anybody who thought that was all natural, I have, I, I have some oceanfront property in Oklahoma I want to sell you. I mean, just look at the dude. That dude, dude, he was more yoked out than like the ultimate warrior in his heyday. Or macho man. Yes. And he's like, all I do is eat animal organs. And you're like, yeah, no, man, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that at all. Like you might be eating, you might be eating animal liver, but you got, you know, like Roger said, you got a, you know, a double stack of steroids on the side for an yeah. appetizer. <laughs> With a side of a trend balone sandwich. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, exactly. The roids are it, in the liver <laughs> right know, he's pa- yeah, in yeah. the organs <laughs> and he's packed them in yeah i mean hey at the end of the day you know what man yeah barry bonds never tested positive but neither did the liver king um you know he didn't test positive either but it kind of worked out the same huh so i again you know what man it, it goes back to like you know like luke said i don't i don't care if you take steroids that's dude that's fine but again you know you're out you're making money on a lot you're making money telling people, you know, hey, you can eat animal livers too and look just like me. And it's just not true. And you got a lot of people out there, you know, and we talk about them all the time. We talked about it, you know, at the very beginning of this podcast who are just, there's willful ignorance. When somebody tells you something, the first thing that you should do is trust, but verify. Just like Reagan said, okay, yeah, hey man, that's awesome. You can, you know, you can just see animal livers and gonads, and, and you know, I can be yoked like you. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna turn around. I'm gonna go do some due diligence on that, and figure out, okay, what's the ground truth? Because cavemen, you know, ate that stuff all the time, and they didn't come out, you know, looking like Hulk Hogan in his heyday. You know, it just, it just, but people are gullible, man. People, those are the same people who send money to the Nigerian, you know, the Nigerian prince. Um, you know, send me three thousand dollars, and I'll send you thirty million. It just, you know, but the when it comes to when it comes to the Rock, with based on the Rock's age, there's no way that he's not on something. There's absolutely and no that dude is way. huge. He's massive, right? He's absolutely massive with his age. There's no way he's not on something, and it's fun. Like Luke said, you know what? Hey, if you are taking, you know. TRT because you're getting a little older, those levels are dropping a little bit, or maybe they're not dropping a little bit, but you're just not seeing, you know, you're not seeing the gains like you used to, you know, you just need something to maintain. Hey, it's, that's fine. Go, go talk to your doc and say, Hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I need. And, you know, and, and, and do it or don't, but don't come out and be like, Oh, this is, you know, this is all natural. I, you know, fucking 18 pancakes in the morning for breakfast, you know, and a half dozen eggs. Like, come on, don't take, no, you don't. (laughs) <laughs> That's not what makes you as big as you are and as yoked as you are. It's just, it's just not, you know, and there, I mean, you take in like Ronnie Coleman, that guy was just, he was an absolute freak. Right. Um, and then, you know, some of the others too, CT Fletcher, right. CT Fletcher back in his prime. Holy moly. Did you see that guy? Like, you know, he was how many, you know, I forget a couple times, bench press champion, strict curl champion, you know, world champion, stuff like that. And, you know, 
And then it was after that, after that, he came out and, you know, he cut a lot of weight, a lot of fat, but and then he was just ripped up, but he was massive. And he's like, well, I don't take steroids. It's all natural. And it's like, man, I love CT Fletcher. I love me some CT Fletcher. That's what I listen to when I'm in my garage working out because I need that motivation. You know, I need somebody telling me how, you know, what a piece of, what a POS I am. Um, you know, <laughs> to, to, to did you see it. his last video that he put out? Cause yeah, you know, yeah, he had yeah. another heart dude, that guy, dude, yeah, like he's, he's struggling a to do a push up. Yeah. He's a shell of his former self. And it's really sad to see, because I do believe CT Fletcher's a good dude, man. Like he's a, he's a good person. Um, you know, I, I watched one of his motivational talks and it was really, really good. And, you know, he wasn't screaming and yelling and, you know, uh, or anything, but like, Hey man, it's okay. Just be like, look, I pumped a lot of, all right, don't get me wrong. That dude, that dude lifted some weight and he moved some weight around as did Ronnie Coleman. That does the rock, you know, like those dudes pick up and they move some weight, right? Their bench press is definitely stronger than, you know, stronger than mine, you know, stuff like that. But just like, listen, be honest about it. Like, hey, well, that's the difference with is... like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? I mean, he admitted it early yeah. on. He used oh, to yeah. use it, and and you never hear anything about it anymore. Nope. I mean, what's the shame? What's the shame in it? It's like, okay, I mean, here's the thing: you can take all that stuff. It doesn't just you don't just take all this stuff and sit on the couch. You have to incorporate very strict diet, very strict workout regimens. This stuff does it. It's not magic. It just basically kickstarts the body. So again, I mean, we're, we're going over the same stuff. It's like, why, what's the shame in it? I don't get it. Like, it's not sports. It's not like professional where you're, you know, uh, Lance Armstrong or Barry Bonds. Well, not Barry Bonds, maybe. Whatever, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I do I have something to tell our listeners though, real quick. And we'll put it here. We'll have to write it down so we can always come back to this game tape. So none of us are on HGH. I'm just putting that out there right now. Can't afford it. Uh, Can't afford it, and uh, I don't think anybody would look at us and mistaken us for 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 being on any type of people look at my gut and be like, "You injected (laughs) HGH directly into your gut, bro," because that's where it looks like it's going. Like you're injecting duck and you're injecting duck and donuts into your gut. (laughs) Oh, duck and donuts. So hey, okay, so I got to bring this up because we're we're getting late into the podcast here, so. Mike Leach, you guys are both familiar with Mike Leach, right? Yeah, from from back in the day. And it's like, why on earth would Josh and Roger be familiar with Mike Leach? Because you know he was a Texas Tech coach. They moved on to Washington State, and he was a Mississippi State coach. It's like those are three schools that aren't like in the spotlight. You know, that's not Alabama. It's not UCLA. It, you know, the the big school, Ohio State, Michigan. It's like. Mike Leach was a legendary savage. That's why everybody liked him. He he just he spoke his mind. He was he was like that that oddity, you know, an agent of chaos. Uh that that was he was fun to watch. And it, believe me, when he was at when he was at Texas Tech, it was a lot of fun. Because I I, I will maintain this till the day I die. The only way Texas Tech will ever even sniff a national championship is if they have a gimmick. And Mike Leach's gimmick was the air raid offense. It threw everyone off. They didn't know how to they didn't know how to deal with it because it's like, you know what? We're just gonna we're gonna go for it on every single down. We're not we're not going for three or four yards. We're going for at least 25 or a touchdown on every single drive offense. Now, Mike Leach's defense wasn't that good when he was at Texas Tech because he was recruiting all offensive players. It was just fun to watch. It was fun. I mean, I'm a Texas Tech fan. I know we're never going to sniff that national championship. I just want to see a fun game. I want to see a competitive, fun game, and it was good when he was here. And when he got fired from Texas Tech because of Craig James, you remember that nonsense? Oh, that was so bad. His son got a migraine headache, and Mike Leach was like, quit being a P. Why don't you go sit in a dark room? And Craig James' son didn't like that. So Mike Leach ended up getting fired. But the rest of the story with that was it was a perfect time to fire Mike Leach because if he coached for one more year, he was going to get a huge bonus, like half a million dollar bonus. So they fired him at the exact right time. And I mean, 
as you guys probably already know, Mike Leach passed away today. Uh, he had a massive heart attack. Uh, he was out for 10 to 15 minutes before they actually revived him. And it, that that's just bad news. The brain without oxygen for, you know, six minutes, it's touch and go, whether you're going to have, you know, a serious, serious uh, uh, brain issues on that. Brain can't go that long without oxygen. And, you know, he had pneumonia all this season. Uh, I'm getting to a point here. He had pneumonia all this season. He was coached at Mississippi State. He was fighting off pneumonia, walking pneumonia the whole season. I think that was just too hard on his body, and it just his heart just just gave out, and which is a shame, man. The pirate is gone. But I believe that if he would have stayed at Texas Tech, I blame this all on the athletic director of Texas Tech back in 2011 when he was fired. I think it was 2010, 2011. If he would have stayed in Texas Tech, he would never got a pneumonia because he went up to Washington State. It's all you know, humid and nasty and kind of cold and weird up there. And then from there, he goes down to Mississippi State. Now, this is south. It's all humid and nasty and stuff like that. He could have stayed in Lubbock where it's dry and gross and there's dust blowing around. Yeah, he might have had some, you know, brown snot boogers, but he, he'd still be alive today. So I blame the athletic director. So, you know, Mike Leach, I, I'll give a couple quotes here and then get, get Josh and Roger's take on it. You know, um, uh, he had some of the best quotes ever talking about the football players. The reason they don't listen to the coaches is because their uh, fat girlfriends are telling them exactly what they want to hear. He said that on <laughs> national television, their fat girlfriends, their fat little girlfriends. But uh, a couple, a couple quotes real quick. He said uh, one time on players fighting in practice, if you get into a fight, don't take your helmet off. We're looking for smart football players, not dumb ones. In the interest of time, don't get in any more <laughs> fights today. <laughs> and on the officials in the 2007 Tech Texas game in Austin. Now, this is where Mike Leach's genius really came through. It's a genius we will never understand. It's a little like breakfast. You eat ham and eggs. As coaches and players, we're like the ham. You see, the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed. We're like the pig. They're like the chicken. They're involved, but everything rides on this. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying this, and everybody's like, wow, this guy's on another level. Uh, I'll read one more. On his first win with Texas Tech against the New Mexico Lobos, <laughs> quote, it's kind of like doing church surgery with a chainsaw instead of a scalpel. We had pieces and parts flying everywhere. It turned out in our favor. We just got to clean it up next time around. <laughs> the, guy, the guy was a legend, man. The guy was a legend, and he should have never left Texas Tech, first of all. And I'll tell you another guy before I kick it to Roger, who should have never left, te left Texas Tech was Chris Beard, who took him to the finals in the NCAA tournament against, I don't even remember who they were playing. It was uh, Virginia. Yeah, I think it was Virginia. They were playing the Cavaliers. And we lost that game, but Beard took them all that way. And Beard chased the money. He sold his soul to the devil and went to UT. And I think it was Sunday night. He was arrested for aggravated assault on a family member. He beat the hell out of his fiance. And it's like, if you hadn't left Texas Tech, bro, your career wouldn't be over. Yeah, you wouldn't have had the limelight, but I guarantee that probably would not have happened. So, yeah, Chris Beard, UT is the devil. Don't leave Texas Tech. That's, that's all I got to say. So, Roger, do you have any Mike Leach anything? I mean, did you follow him? Did you think he was funny? Anything like that? You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't follow him as far as like I followed Roy Williams or Dean Smith or something like that with college basketball. But obviously, I mean, his quotes were all over ESPN, all over the media. My takeaway from him and not knowing anything about him personally, but one, I think he actually cared a lot for the kids and, and everybody that you talk to, or you hear somebody talk about him. Because one thing, especially and, and you, especially nowadays when in college football, and you even see it in college basketball, and you talk about coaches leaving for the money and this and that, there are some coaches there that understand what their roles are with the kids. Because in short, you know, especially as a college athlete, you know, he's their friend, he's their mentor. Sometimes he's their parent. Uh, sometimes he's the pastor. Sometimes he's their lawyer. Sometimes he's their doctor. You know, one thing I think you can take away from the, you know, just his quotes and, and, and his analogies is this is a guy who related to the kids that he coached and that he taught and that he mentored. 
uh, and, and a guy that uh, truly treated those kids as, as one of his own. And I tell you, a lot of times, man, you know, we, we, we think it's funny. You know, he talks about the aliens and Bigfoot and, you know, but it, it's how he relates, man. It's how he relates these kids nowadays. It, it, and not just nowadays, right? Throughout his entire coaching career. Uh, to, to span more than two, three, four, five years nowadays. I mean, you got to be successful, not at just winning, but also relating, identifying with the kids out there. And, it, you know, it lets you know when you get older, when you start, uh, you know, one of the, the, the first big, big coaching losses that I remember, you know, obviously, you know, being a Carolina fan was like Dean Smith. And that's how you know you're getting older when you lose those great coaches like Dean Smith, Bill Guthridge, uh, and now with Mike Leach, you know, it's, you don't hear, you know, they're great because it's not about Dean Smith or any of these guys. It's, you don't hear about like championships, wins, losses. Okay. You always hear about their relationship with their kids, their interaction with the media, their interaction with the kids, the families, other people. Uh, and that's how, you know, for those folks, it was, uh, it was a lot more than, than just the game. And, you know, it's uh, obviously prayers out to his family and this and that. I don't know all the uh, the details with the heart attack and this and that. I don't know if he had something previously. It was the, the first issue that he had or was he always, I mean, he was a bigger dude anyway. Uh, yeah, he was not healthy. And he, you know, again, I think it was the pneumonia he was fighting off during the entire football season and being unhealthy like that. I think it was just too much of a strain on his heart and it just gave out. Hey, maybe he got a booster because, you know, it's only mild myocarditis, mild. So yeah, I will throw it to Josh for some of his thoughts on him. I so obviously, you know, I didn't follow I and I don't follow Texas Tech football. Um but I do, Nobody else does either. Right. Um but no, so you know when it comes to when it, when it comes to Mike Lee, so I do love coaches um who are are just straight savages, right? Especially when you get them in press conferences. Um you know, and you know, it's kind of like Nick Saban, right? I mean, Mike Leach wasn't, you know, I mean, he would, he, he would light a reporter up every now and then as well, you know, for, for some nonsense. And I love that, uh, you know, and so Mike Leach, he had, you know, he was talking in, in one quote. I remember you didn't read it. And I, I don't know which one it is and exactly how it goes, but like Mike Leach hate, hated candy corn, right? He compared candy corn to like fruitcake. And I love candy corn, it made me dislike Mike Leach a little bit, but it made me listen to him. And, and like Roger said, like his quotes are all over. They were all over ESPN every week, you know, because he was always saying something outlandish and outrageous. Like, you know, fat, the fat little girlfriends was hilarious. Right. Because we like, who says that? Who does that? Most coaches get up there and they try and watch their, you know, they, they, they watch their P's and Q's and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, but you know, he, he, he was not, uh, he was not scared to, to speak his mind and that's always a good thing, especially in, you know, in today's world, uh, we need more people who, who, who you know, aren't afraid to get up there, uh, and, and do that. Um, and not to take it off Mike Leach, but I tell you, I'm super excited, you know, about Deion Sanders taking over, you know, the, the coaching job at Colorado, right. Cause Colorado was dead, like dead last in everything. Um, and so, but no, nah, man, it, it, it was good to, uh, you know, to, to listen to Mike Leach's quotes every now and then. And, uh, he will certainly, he will certainly be missed. Um, so I'll, uh, I'm going to give a shout out or two that I'm going to kick over to Luke and go around the horn and, uh, and, uh, one of those guys can, uh, can close it out. Um, I won't use too many names, but, uh, but, but Ted, thanks for listening. Uh, you and your wife really appreciate you guys listening. Um, I didn't, I didn't even know you listened until last week. Uh, so, but it's awesome that you do. We definitely appreciate it. I hope I didn't sound like too much of a crazy person. You know, last week, Luke, Luke was pushing my buttons and, uh, and Luke knows just how to get me fired up. Um, he's just, he's just like my wife in that regard. And, uh, so, Hey, John up in DC, thanks for listening. Jason out in Louisiana, uh, all the, uh, all the usual suspects that, uh, that listen to comment, the, the Ryan's up in, uh, Northern Virginia. And, uh, you know, Damon and, and everybody else, we really appreciate you taking the, uh, taking the time to, uh, to listen to us ramble on. And hopefully after this one, you won't think I'm a, you know, crazy person either. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. I don't know. Makes it fun. Keeps it spicy. Luke. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Josh for reminding me of things I had forgotten 
where I was calling him out for stupid stuff and it made me feel really, really dumb. I was calling him out for stupid stuff, what, 25 years ago? And I was like, I don't even remember that, but it doesn't surprise me that I said some stupid stuff like that. So shout out to Josh for making me feel two inches high. Yeah, and again, with uh, with Ted and his wife, I, I really appreciate uh, of them listening. I, I, like Josh, I was like, wow, wow, they listened? Because I, I, like Josh said, I feel like they look at us like animals in the zoo. Like, you know, we're going to have a coyote in our house tonight. Let's, let's, let's see how this goes. <laughs> you know? So, I, I mean, they're, they're great, great folks and we really appreciate them. And, uh, you know, like Josh said, usual suspects, you know, uh, uh, Jesse yelling at cars as he's, as he's driving, uh, up uh, I-35. Appreciate you listening. Uh, all, all you folks, uh, Dylan, you know, stick with us. Uh, Dylan said that, you know, if, if he gets too far behind on podcasts, he just stops listening. So Dylan, Hey man, uh, we don't come out with them that often. So appreciate you sticking with us and everybody else. I want to kind of, Oh, and one more person, you know, uh, my daughter, you know, the millennial I was talking about, she's, she's really proud of her. And I, it sounded like I was giving her a hassle earlier. I, I am, but at the same time, super proud of you. So thanks for listening to this one. I think she will actually listen to this. That's why I'm giving her a shout out. Uh, one last thing I'll kick it to Roger. One last quote from Mike Leach about the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets. <laughs> How come they, they get to pretend they're soldiers? The thing is, they aren't actually in the military. I ought to have a Mike's Pirate School. The freshmen, all they get is a bandana. When you're a senior, you get a sword and skull and crossbones. For homework, we'll work on pirate maneuvers and stuff like that. <laughs> Rest in peace, Mike Leach. We miss you. Now, I just want to echo what Luke and Josh said. Thank, you know, thanks for all the listeners out there. Uh, special shout out to the administration uh, taking credit for uh, seven point one percent inflation. You know, it's kind of crazy. You read Twitter and it's like seven point one percent, and you know, it's like, so when do they realize that it's seven point one percent year over year? Uh, and, and we could continue going down this road. So it's uh, hang on to your wallets, folks. Uh, much like this episode, we were talking about digital currency, cryptocurrency. Looks like it's going to be a pretty wild ride and should be uh, pretty fun next two years up to the elections. I, I'm sure I'm sure we'll still be around with our dozens and dozens of listeners. But uh, thanks to all of you out there for continuing to watch us, continuing to listen to us. Uh, one thing I did, you know, so I flew back from Pittsburgh. I went to a Steelers game. Unfortunately, they lost. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, dude, I, I was a huge advocate for you uh, for months. I was selling you. I was selling you to, <laughs> to anybody that would listen. And I unfortunately had to take back any good thing that I said about you because your your play was was just horrible. But what I did notice coming back, I made a, a, a point to do this, especially on the flight. And, and you know how flight attendants are. You get on the plane. You get off the plane. Like, hey, have a great day. Enjoy Phoenix. Enjoy Pittsburgh. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And for everybody, every, every flight that I got, got off of and every flight attendant I passed, I said, Hey, have a Merry Christmas. And there was an immediate, like upbeat, like, Oh, thank you. You have a very Merry Christmas too. And it was genuine. It wasn't like a fake thing or whatever. And, and I heard somebody talk about it the other day. It's like, not even with, you know, even if you, you don't celebrate Christmas, you celebrate something else, whether it's Hanukkah or Ramadan, whatever it is that you celebrate. It's like, Hey, it's, it's a happy holiday. And, and, and the way that I say is like, okay, Merry Christmas, but obviously if you don't celebrate Christmas, Merry whatever it is that you do celebrate. But it was kind of <laughs> Trubisky equals Baker, Baker Mayfield. I don't know, man. After the last game, Baker Mayfield, I mean, he pulled that out. Uh, what, he'd been on the team for two days? I mean, it's I'm not a Baker Mayfield fan. He sucks anyway. But, uh, my, my, you know, it's, it's funny with the start of Carolina Tar Heels basketball season, which they won today, thank God, beat the Citadel. Uh, and the Steelers, you know, my son, he, he's at that age where he's young and he's, you know, he, we took him to the game and I'm like, son, this year, you know, some years it's just, it's tough to be a fan, you know, and, and I know uh, Luke being a Texas Tech fan, uh, you know, he he understands this uh, so heartedly. Uh, some years it's just tough to be a fan. They're, they're very frustrating years. So anyway, with that being said, uh, I'm sure we'll put another episode out, but just in case we don't. Merry Christmas to all those that celebrate it and happy holidays to whatever you, you decide to celebrate. But I'm sure here over the next two weeks, we'll get a, we'll get another episode out there, but thanks to everybody listening. Uh, stay safe out there. Keep your canteen cups tightly secured and full of some really good booze.